Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome back to yet another Yellow Version Solo Challenge. I'm Druzy, and today we have our first legendary Pokemon of the series with the legendary ice bird, Articuno. Before we get into the discussion on Articuno, I want to give huge props to Professor Oak for capturing this legendary bird with just a single Pokeball. Such a clutch move by the professor who's lecturing me about not going into the tall grass when he's literally doing the exact same thing. Anyway, I think Articuno has a really good chance to knock Tauros off the top of the tier list, and that's because even though Articuno has the lowest stat total of any of the legendary Gen 1 Pokemon, it still has the 6th best base stat total of all Gen 1 Pokemon. And while the stats are impressive, it is really the typing that I think is going to be most helpful, especially in the early game. One major downside I do see is that our learn set doesn't give great coverage, which could be a problem later in the run, but strong ice moves will be really helpful. We're going to be forcing our rival to evolve into Jolteon today, and that extra speed from the electric type is probably going to make it more dangerous than Flareon would be. So we need to win the lab fight, and that was absolutely no problem as you just saw a single ice beam, although it was a critical hit, is all that's needed to knock out our rival's Eevee. So with the lab fight won, let's take a quick look at the moves we'll be dealing with today. We don't learn many moves by level up because we shouldn't actually have access to Articuno until it's level 50, but Ice Beam will be huge in this run. This is the main reason I feel confident that we may have a new champion after this one's finished. It's a 95 base power and it gets stab, so we effectively have a 142.5 base power move right away at the start of the game. When you combine that high base power with the high special stat thanks to Articuno's great base stats, we're going to have a great early game on our hands. We also get access to agility, which should be very helpful for badge boost glitch exploits later in the game, and also let us outspeed, which is going to be really important because Articuno is not that fast. Our TM and HM learn set is not too diverse, but we do get a couple early game water moves to help boost our attacking options early, since we won't be learning very many moves otherwise. Because we're going to be forcing our rival to go for Jolteon, we're going to have to fight him in Battle 1A, but that's just as easy as the lab fight. We are slower than both his Pokemon, but a single Ice Beam takes out Spearow, and thanks to a misclick, it's going to end up taking three turns to finally take down the Eevee, but because it failed two status moves and missed the one tackle it went for, we still aren't going to have taken any damage on this run, and that's a pretty great start. I don't think it's going to continue, but let's see if it can continue as we move on to face Brock. While Brock can sometimes be a huge hurdle in the early game, I don't think that's going to be a problem today, and it turns out to be true, as we outspeed Geodude and Ice Beam is easily a one-shot. Onyx is next, and Onyx does outspeed us, but it only goes for Screech, and one Ice Beam takes it out as well, and the damageless run continues as we've earned our first badge. This is one of the fastest Brock splits I've had so far, so I think that Articuno is in a great place right now, but we'll see if this early game lead it's building can last throughout the game. So with Brock out of the way, we can move forward to buying our precious Magikarp from the random guy outside of Mount Moon. And then after that, we'll fast forward a little bit and I'm gonna go right into our encounter with Rival 2. And I'm choosing to battle him first because Misty will resist our ice moves and that's going to make that a little bit more complicated. So let's get right into Rival 2 and see if we'll take damage for the first time this run. Well, Spiro had a chance, but wasted it with Leer, and then with Sand Shrew out, we're going to easily knock that out with Ice Beam. Rattata comes out and does not use Quick Attack, so that's also a one-shot. So now Eevee's out last, hangs on from an Ice Beam, goes for Tail Whip. I used Water Gun to see if he would attack. He didn't, and so with that, we have to finish him off, and we do. And that is now three separate occasions without taking any damage from our rival. Articuno is off to a blazing start so far. But let's see if that continues as we take the next step when we face off against Misty and her water types. We're going to come into this battle picking up a few more levels thanks to the trainers north of town, so we're actually going to be higher level than Staryu. Our Ice Beam, as I mentioned before, isn't very effective though, so it does take two attacks to take out Misty's first Starfish. With Staryu out of the way, Starmie's next, and it does outspeed us, but it uses its first two turns to set up defense boosts. Our Ice Beam looks to be about a 4 hit KO, and a crit water gun still didn't do too much, so even with a second critical water gun, we easily take out Starmie, leveling up in the process and earning our second badge. 
Although we did take damage for the first time in a major battle, I'll give Articuno a pass as it was a tough matchup. Misty also gives us Bubble Beam for our win, and we're going to teach this to Articuno. Gives us more power points so we can avoid healing at Pokemon Centers a bit longer, which isn't a huge deal, but it will save some time. We can make our way south of Vermilion City and the SS Anne, where we can get another battle with our rival. We now outspeed the Spearow for the first time. Easy knockout with Ice Beam. Batata comes out next, and it uses Quick Attack for 5 damage, the first damage our rivals caused to us during this run. And it turns out to be the only damage done to our legendary bird though as we knock out Rattata and Sandshrew with a single Bubble Beam each. And it does take three Bubble Beams to KO Eevee, but it only went for Tail Whip, so it's still not much excitement from our rival this run. Will Lieutenant Surge pose a bigger challenge to our legendary bird? Well, before we can find out, we have to dig through some trash to earn our right to battle the Electric Gym Leader. And honestly, I wish I could tell you that he puts up a better fight. His Raichu does outspeed us, but it misses a Mega Kick off for the first turn as an Ice Beam does over half damage to his Electric Mouse. Instead of using Thunderbolt, which would have been very scary, he decides to use Growl and we get a crit. Didn't matter on our Ice Beam, and now we have three badges. With Surge now defeated, we're going to make our way through Rock Tunnel and head over to Celadon, where we're going to pick up a fresh water for the little girl and a soda pop for the Saffron Guards. We're going to trade that water for Ice Beam, and I don't think we're going to need it, but it is a good insurance policy in case we decide to delete Ice Beam either accidentally or intentionally for some reason in the future. Since we have a really good type advantage against Erica, we're going to take her on before heading to the Rocket Hideout. I'm very confident we can get a quick and easy win here for our fourth badge and avoid accidentally forgetting Erica because it is easily the most out of the way of the eight gems and easily forgotten. While we're talking about things that are forgettable, this battle with Erica continues the trend of easy, forgettable, boring gym leader battles. This time, Articuno outspeeds all of Erica's plants and makes quick work of her entire team with Ice Beam. Three up, three down, and that's our fourth badge, which means we can now go and head to face Giovanni in the basement of the Rocket Hideout. Giovanni's team is also probably going to be pretty easy, thanks to our typing on Articuno. Onyx is going to be out first and is an easy one shot with Bubble Beam, and Rhydon's going to be out next and also will be an easy one shot with Bubble Beam. That's going to bring out Persian, his last Pokemon, and his fancy cat goes for Screech on the first turn, and Ice Spring brings it to red, but doesn't get the KO. And I would say in the biggest surprise of the run so far, Giovanni didn't decide to use a guard spec, going for Growl instead, and you have to question why here. It shouldn't have mattered as our Ice Beam clearly was going to finish his cat off, but it's well established he loves guard specs more than winning, so maybe something to keep an eye on moving forward, because I'm a little bit concerned for him. Rival 4 is up next, and if you are expecting anything different from the previous battles, you're in for a huge disappointment. The first four members of his team are all one-shots, either with Ice Beam or Bubble Beam. Articuno is an absolute beast. I know it's a legendary, but still, this has been insanely easy so far. Eevee's out last, and it does get a single quick attack off before we get a crit with Bubble Beam to complete the five one-hit KOs in the battle. That crit likely did matter, but the battle wasn't in ever in any danger. So far, through 5 rival battles, we've taken 11 total damage from our rival while knocking out 16 of his Pokemon. Those are some pretty impressive stats. It's now off to Fuchsia City to take on Koga and his army of Venonat line. We're coming into this battle poisoned from the juggler before Koga to avoid getting hit with Toxic or worse Hypnosis. We outspeed the first two Venonats, getting a crit which definitely mattered on the first, only taking a weak Psybeam on the second before getting the knockout. We level up to level 34, and you can see we're very underleveled compared to Koga's team, and are still making things look easy. And speaking of things that look easy, we got a freeze on Venonat, which is a 10% chance, and essentially is a knockout. In Gen 1, you can only unfreeze if you use a healing item, or get hit with an attack that can cause a burn, and we don't have those, so that's game over for Koga. And speaking of game over, we get another freeze on Venomoth, ensuring that we are definitely going to get the win and pick up our 5th gym badge. That was definitely the most challenging gym battle by far but we still got the win pretty easily. We can now either take on Blaine or face Rival Fival with our weakness to fire. I think Blaine sounds scary, so let's head over to Sylph for the famous rival battle and see how that goes. Sand Slash is a one-shot with Ice Beam and Ninetales is going to come out next, and Bubble Beam does good damage over half, and Ember really doesn't do too much damage to us, and we get the knockout on the next turn. Cloyster is out next, and we don't have a great answer for this one. Ice Beam is double resisted and is really weak, and we see Bubble Beam isn't much better with its single resistance. With the high defense of Cloyster, I don't think our flying moves are going to help, so I go back to Ice Beam and it does crit. A potion 
prolongs the battle a little bit, but ultimately a bubble beam is able to take out Cloyster. Kadabra is out next, and it has very low defense, so a single fly takes it out to bring out Jolteon next. Jolteon outspeeds us and crits with a Thundershock, and even though it's a weak move, it did huge damage. We didn't get a freeze with our Ice Beam, so one more Thundershock finished us off. On our next attempt, we know Sand Slash is still going to be a one-shot with Ice Beam, and this time when Ninetales comes out, it does less damage with Ember, and we're able to take it out over the course of two turns with Bubble Beam. Cloyster's going to come out next, and this thing is proving to be a massive problem for us. Our moves just don't match up well against it, and after a few turns of doing weak damage and being confused, we end up hitting ourselves in confusion and get caught in a critical hit clamp. Just great. It only lasts for three turns, but the damage has been done at this point. Although Ainz fights valiantly here, ultimately it isn't enough and we end up losing to this cloister. This doesn't bode well for us now for a couple of reasons. It means we're going to need to level up to get past our rival, but looking ahead, this could be a huge problem against the Elite Four when both Lorelei and the Champion have a Cloister. Before trying another rematch, I ran through the Fighting Dojo for some experience and we come back for our rematch two levels higher than before. Sand Slash and Ninetales are still going the same way, and we have a little bit more health going into the Cloister. I decided to test out Fly, it's not doing much here, and it's worse than our special attacks. Cloister caught us in a short clamp, but fortunately we get a crit with Ice Beam to take the Cloister to red health and one more Bubble Beam takes it out to bring us back to Kadabra. Kadabra still is an easy one shot with Fly and we're back to Jolteon once again. Jolteon still outspeeds us and it hits us with a Thundershock for really good damage, but we get the 17% chance to crit with our Ice Beam, making it a one shot. Sure, this is a little bit lucky, but I'm gonna take it. It's a little bit concerning for the late game though, because we're going to have to figure out a good strategy to get past Cloyster and Jolteon figured out. Otherwise, we're going to be in for some trouble, but our next main battle isn't going to give us any trouble at all. It's our second battle with Giovanni, and it's really straightforward. The biggest concern is saving some Ice Beam PP. Giovanni did finally use a guard spec with Nidorino's turn, so we didn't take damage there. We outsped Persian, and we got a one-hit KO with Ice Beam as well. Rhyhorn is a one-shot with Bubble Beam, and that brings out Nidoqueen. I go for a Bubble Beam on a misclick and it does big damage. Giovanni uses another guard spec and we sweep the crime boss without taking any damage. This battle is particularly easy and it opens up the option to take on Sabrina and that's exactly where we're going to next. On our first battle against the Psychic Gym Leader, it doesn't start well as Abra outspeeds and hits us with a flash to lower our accuracy. I go for Peck and find out it's not a one shot. I know it's weak, but I wasn't expecting that. We were either in a speed tie or the accuracy drop activated our, our badge boost glitch and we outsped, finished off the Abra the next turn. We go for fly against Kadabra and it, you waste some time using recovers and we hit it for really good damage, getting a crit and a one shot to bring out Alakazam. Psychic hits us though and it does huge damage and a special drop. So it sets up reflect when we're in the air, we miss anyway and one more Psychic takes us down. That first battle was a bit rough, but on the rematch, we're still getting hit with Fly, and it looks like that's activating the badge boost glitch to help us outspeed Abra. And even though it takes a long time, we eventually get the KO with Fly, because we know that Peck isn't going to be a one-shot to bring out Kadabra. Kadabra leads off with a Psychic, and it does about one-third of our health, as we retaliate with a Fly that does over half to the Kadabra. I thought Peck would finish it off, but after a miss and a weak sideway from Kadabra, it leaves Kadabra with a sliver of health. Then things get weird as we get a Gen 1 miss from Psychic when we miss another Peck, and it turns out to be huge as another Psychic takes us to red before we finish off the Kadabra with one more Peck. We aren't in great shape heading into Alakazam, so I go for the Hail Mary going for an Ice Beam, which misses, but on the second turn, we get the freeze we're looking for. We're fortunate enough that Sabrina went for a full health recover, thank you Gen 1 AI, followed by a Reflect, and now we take our time finishing off the Alakazam, and that's going to be perfect. We got a crit on a fly, giving us a quick KO, and although it was a really weird battle, which included a Gen 1 miss and a freeze chance, it's still a win. Sabrina can be tough, but a lot of times it comes down to whether she uses Psychic or not. Regardless, that's our sixth badge. We're going to trash her gift of Psywave, because we can't learn it, and even if we could, I wouldn't want it and that means we can now move on to our only option, which is facing Blaine in the Fire Gym. It is easy to say that I am not looking forward to this one. We start off against Ninetales and our Bubble Beam crits and we still don't get a one shot, which is not a great place to start. 
We do outspeed on the next time and we get the knockout before Rapidash does huge damage thanks to a critical takedown and we can't get the knockout and we lost to Blaine without him using a fire move. That's not a great place to be and on the rematch, Ninetales leads with a tail whip activating badge boost glitch and with the help of that and a critical bubble beam, we're able to get the knockout with back to back attacks. Rapidash is next and Growl further boosts our speed and just like Ninetales, that gave us enough speed to knock it out with back to back attacks. That brings us to Arcanine and we outspeed starting with a critical hit bubble beam as takedown misses. We then finish him off with one more bubble beam and we have a perfect victory against the fire leader. Wow, I would not have expected that, but Blaine literally helped me as much as possible there. That gives us seven badges now and we're going to toss out fire blast because we can't use it. And then we're gonna head off to face Giovanni for the last time. I'm feeling pretty good heading into this one since our last battles have gone so well and we start things off on a good note when we one-shot Doug Trio with an Ice Beam. Persian's out next and even though it outspeeds, Giovanni goes for his classic guard spec, I'm glad to see he's back to normal, before using double team and we're able to knock him out without taking any damage. The Nitos are out next and Ice Beam comes close to knocking out Nito Queen, but Thunder misses and we're able to take it out with a peck the next turn. Nido King's out next, and unlike Nido Queen, it is a one shot. I don't know if that was because it has less HP or because we were in a damage range, but either way, it's down, and a single bubble beam takes out Rhydon for yet another damageless gym leader battle. And that gives us eight total, and now we've earned all eight, and we've made most of them look pretty easy. Before we get to the Elite Four, we have to beat our rival for the seventh time. And Sand Slash and Execute were both one shots and Ninetales only does weak damage with an Ember before we're able to two shot it with Bubble Beam. Cloyster is now out and this is still a problem for us. I go with Fly to save some Ice Beam PP and it's looking to be about a five turn KO. After a hard end by Cloyster, we're going to have to switch to special moves, which isn't too much of a problem as we do get a crit with Ice Beam, even though we're confused. I get cute going for Bubble Beam thinking it'll be a knockout, which leads to another three turn clamp and more damage taken, but a peck ultimately is able to take the Cloyster down and bring out Kadabra. We get outsped right away and a critical hit from Psybeam takes us out. I don't know if the crit mattered there, but we were in a rough place anyway, and a few more levels would probably make this much more consistent, so I used a few rare candies and come back to this battle again, this time at level 49. Sand Slash is still a one shot with Ice Beam, and Execute is as well. Ninetales survives our Bubble Beam and retaliates with an Ember for a little bit more damage before we knock it out on turn two with another Bubble Beam. Our Nemesis Cloyster is now out, and this time we're going for Ice Beam right away. We get confused, but other than that, Cloyster decides to just use Withdraw, so we're able to snap out of confusion as we get an Ice Beam that crits, guaranteeing we're going to get a four hit KO. With Kadabra now out, we get to see those extra levels make a big difference in this one as we now outspeed, get in the air with Fly, and get a one hit KO. Jolteon's out next, Thunder misses, and then he goes for Thunder Wave, and that allows us to avoid paralysis, get the knockout, and beat our rival, unlocking the Elite Four. That Thunder Miss was so crucial there. I don't know if we would have survived, and if we did, it would have been really close. I'm really worried about the rematch when he's a champion because we could get all the way to the end of the challenge only to get one shot with a Thunder to end it all. That's a problem for future Druzy to deal with though because right now we need to make our way through Victory Road and onto the Elite Four, starting with Ice Trainer Lorelei. We're coming into this one at level 50, so we're pretty underleveled. We do have a legendary Pokemon though, so we might have a chance here. However, any hope of a win quickly fades against Dugong as this thing is a bit more of a problem than I expected. I did not expect the resistance to ice to be such a problem, and because it can rest to heal up, I'm in a bit of a tough spot. We need it to use rest, and then we can switch into fly, but really we need to take this thing out quickly, and we don't do it here, We're taking a lot of damage in the process, only to bring out Cloyster, and we've already seen that this thing is a giant pain to our Articuno. Ice Beam is going to make this a five hit KO, and by the time we finally take Cloyster down, we're going to be in red health thanks to all of the spike cannons that Lorelei gets off. So at this point, our only hope against Slowbro is to hope it doesn't attack. And things start out pretty well as it decides not to attack for quite some time as we whittle it down with Ice Beam. It's looking like we might have a chance as we bring it down to red health, but it survives with the sliver. Lorelei goes for a couple of retroactive super potions and now we have no more Ice Beam PP. So we have to switch to Bubble Beam and it's just not doing enough 
Amnesia has boosted it so much that finally, a Psychic takes us out. While this was a loss, it wasn't too unexpected. Coming into this run, I thought we would struggle a bit against Lorelei, and I think a few more levels and update to our moves make a big difference here. We're going to begin our realistic league attempts now, starting at level 55. This level is important because it is when Articuno learns agility. This gives us access to the badge boost glitch, but also helps boost our speed, which is very helpful since Articuno doesn't have great speed. We've also added Mimic to our moves, and that's going to be useful to get us some different options and different strategies moving forward. The new strategy for Dugong is to set up our agility boost while it rests, and then we're going to use Fly to quickly take it out. It only takes a couple of flies for the Dugong to go down. Cloister's out next, and our boosted Ice Beam is now going to be about a 3-hit KO instead of the 5-hit KO it was before. We do take a little bit of damage from a 2-turn Clamp, but we do get the Cloister knocked out in 3 turns, and this was the easiest we've had a Cloister knockout in the entire run. With Slowbro out next, we can now use Mimic for the first time, using it to steal Amnesia. Because the special stat is offensive and defensive in Gen 1, it's one of the best stat boosting moves in the game. With only 2 Amnesias and 1 from Slowbro, we still do over half damage with a resisted Ice Beam. Fantastic result, and we're able to get an easy knockdown after that. Jinx is out next, and it goes down quickly to a critical hit fly. Last out is now going to be Lapras, and our fly does big damage here before we get hit with our Confuse Ray. This complicates things a little bit as we hit ourselves in Confusion once before we snap out of Confusion and leave Lapras with a sliver of health from Ice Beam. This triggers a retroactive Super Potion from Lorelei, and that means we can finish it off on the next turn and get our first Elite Four victory. This was a good battle, and I really liked how it felt moving through. There could have been some snags, but overall I felt it was pretty consistent and will likely be pretty easy to clear moving forward if we need to. And as we talk about things that are easy, we are about to take on the easiest member of the Elite Four, Bruno. In theory, he does have a type advantage on us since his rock moves would be four times super effective, but his team is just awful. His onyx is too slow and it goes down to a single ice beam, and that's going to ring out Hitmonchan. For Hitmonchan, we're getting a really creative and using the exact same move also knocking it out with a single Ice Beam. Against Hitmonlee, we do get a Gen 1 miss, and that makes things a little bit more interesting here because now we have to wait until we can avoid the double team that he set up, finally getting another one-hit KO with Ice Beam. Get another one-hit KO with Onyx, and that brings out Machamp, who survives but gets frozen, which is essentially a knockout, and that's going to allow us to take it out with a fly, beating Bruno. With Bruno out of the way, we can now see how we match up against Agatha for the first time. And I'm pretty confident going into this one, but her Ghost House beating me does have me a bit nervous. On the other hand, I think Fly should be able to take advantage of her Ghost Low defense, so there isn't much more to do here but get right to the battle and see how it goes. Things start out well when we outspeed Gengar number one. It goes for substitute, so we only get 25% damage on our first attack. Our next Fly is enough to take it down to red health, triggering a Super Potion, Luckily, Gengar doesn't set up a substitute, and we knock it out on the next turn. Golbat's out next, and Ice Beam takes it out in a single turn. Hunter's next, and we go for Fly, and unfortunately, we get the 5% chance to miss, opening Articuno to a Confuse Ray. I risk it and go for Fly, but it doesn't work out for us. We hit ourselves in Confusion two times in a row, and then things get worse when Haunter hits us with Hypnosis. We aren't taking too much damage from Lick, but then it searches a Dream Eater and uses Dream Eater four times in a row, which ends up being enough to take us down. Wow, just terrible luck there, but I knew that could be a possibility. Sleep is so powerful in Gen 1, and this is exactly why. So we're going to head back to the start of the league again, starting with Lorelei. There aren't many changes in strategies in either the Bruno or the Lorelei battles, so we're going to speed things up a bit. The main thing to see here is that these two battles are very consistent overall. This has me feeling really good that this is a reliable strategy, and the only thing we need to worry about against Lorelei is an untimely crit from our Articuno, or getting crit by one of her team members, but both are pretty unlikely thanks to the low base speed of Articuno and her team members such as Lapras. When it comes to Bruno, the only thing that can be interesting in the Bruno battle is if we get a Gen 1 miss like we saw before, or if we get a crit against Machamp with our Ice Beam. That's literally the only way this battle changes. Just like always, Bruno is by far the easiest Elite Four member to plan for. He is just streets behind the other three members. And with Bruno defeated, we're now back against Agatha once again. I'm going to be changing up the strategy a little bit, this time leading with Ice Beam instead of Fly to prevent a substitute issue like we saw before. Downside to this, we get paralyzed right away. Gengar follows that up with Confuse Ray, so now we have Parafusion, and we hit ourselves in Confusion twice before being fully paralyzed, 
for we're finally able to get off the ice beam that's going to knock out the trolley ghost. That's going to bring out Golbat, only to be switched into a Haunter and Ice Beam takes it all the way to red health as we snap out of confusion. After a Super Potion and a Dream Eater while they're awake, we're able to get an Ice Beam to knock it out. Golbat comes back out and after getting a couple wing attacks off, because we're paralyzed, we're able to get an Ice Beam to take it down. We level up to level 57 and Arbok comes out, hitting us with an Acid. Ice Beam does huge damage, getting a crit for a one-shot to bring out Gengar number two, who immediately hits us with a Confuse Ray. This now has us in Parafusion again, and between Psychic and us hitting ourselves in Confusion, we lose to Agatha again. It took a couple more tries against Agatha and one loss to Lorelei actually, but we're back to Agatha once more, and this time we get Gengar to red health with Ice Beam and Substitute before we get paralyzed with Lick. This battle is so annoying when you can't one-shot Agatha's team. We end up finishing off Gengar number one and making quick work of Golbat with an Ice Beam. Haunter confuses us and that makes things a little bit more dicey, but we're able to take it out with a couple of Ice Beams and eventually move on to Arbok again. As we'll see, the Ice Beam crit from before did in fact matter as Arbok survives with a sliver of health. It does end up mattering as Agatha uses a Super Potion, so our next Ice Beam got the knockout and Gengar number two comes back out. Agatha decides to go for Dream Eater a couple of times when we're awake and that gives us the opportunity to get the KO and win the battle for the first time. This Agatha battle is so frustrating because so many things can happen to make it harder than it needs to be. Honestly, I think just having one or two more levels would make this thing so much easier. So that is something to consider if we don't get through the league on this attempt. That isn't important now though as we shift our focus to the upcoming Lance battle. This should be pretty easy if we can get by Gyarados. Our same type of attack bonus with Ice Beam is going to be too much for his dragons to handle. First out is Gyarados and our Ice Beam ends up doing about two thirds damage while his Hydro Pump only does 50 damage, which is way less than I was expecting and a great sign for this battle. Another Ice Beam finished off Gyarados and then we do the same to Dragonair number one and Dragonair number two before moving on to Aerodactyl. It does outspeed and goes for Fly, which does huge damage to us but a single Ice Beam is enough to knock out Aerodactyl with a critical hit. I don't know if that mattered, but it doesn't matter against Dragonite as we take it out because of the four times super effective damage, getting the win over Lance. That was a pretty easy battle, and now we can move on to the champ for the first time. We've had problems with Cloyster and Jolteon, but I think we have a better chance now than we do before, thanks to a few new strategies at our disposal. I decided to use one of the two remaining rare candies we have left before healing up and heading in to face our rival. Now the champion, one last time. Can we get the victory right here? Let's cue the champion's theme music and find out now. Sandslash is going to be out first and you might think we'd go for the KO with Ice Beam, but we're going to take this opportunity to mimic Earthquake here. So it'll give us a strong physical attack for later in this battle against Cloyster and Jolteon if we choose to use it. And even with a critical slash, the trade off of one third health seems worth it. We take out Sandslash and Alakazam comes out, outspeeds, gets a critical at Psybeam, and then Earthquake doesn't take it out. Kinesis hits us, we're able to finish off Alakazam, but our accuracy is now lower for the rest of the battle. With Executor out, we're in a bad place, and I go for the Hail Mary, going for a setup of two agilities, and then we're gonna be sitting in red health, so we have to go on the attack, going for Fly, which gets a critical hit and knocks out Executor. Awesome. Cloister's out next, and our Earthquake misses, Spike Kin hits for 12 damage, we're not in a bad place, and Earthquake only does about a fourth damage before a critical hit spike cannon takes us out. Ugh, that was not how I thought that would go at all. I was really expecting our Earthquake to one-shot the rival's Alakazam. We did leave one rare candy on the table, and I'm sure that would have been helpful. Maybe we should go with an attack as soon as possible, or maybe we could try to set up an agility on Sandslash. I'm not really sure what I want to do on the rematch which I'm pretty sure will be coming soon based on our last run through of the Elite Four. The battles up to this point all feel pretty consistent. The Lorelei battle can get dicey, but at this point, we are winning way more often than not with her. Bruno is, well, Bruno, and really, how did he make the Elite Four? Does he have some serious dirt on the other three or something? It really just doesn't make any sense. The first noteworthy battle in our next attempt is against Agatha, like before, we still start out with Ice Beam and it goes for about 60% damage on Gengar as it sets up a substitute. An Ice Beam breaks the substitute and Gengar doesn't have enough health to set up another one, giving us an easy KO. 
Golbat is still going to be a one-shot, and now that means Haunter's out. We do about 3-4 damage with an Ice Beam before we get put to sleep with Hypnosis. We stay asleep for 5 turns which allows Agatha to get a Super Potion in, and a couple of weak licks, and a Confuse Ray before we wake up just in time to avoid a Dream Eater and hit an Ice Beam to knock out the Haunter. 3 down, 2 to go as Arbok comes out. We fight through Confusion and take it to a sliver of a health, triggering a retroactive Super Potion before we hit ourselves in Confusion, then get paralyzed with Glare before we're finally able to take out the Arbok. Gengar confuses us once more as we're able to take it under half health with an Ice Beam before we're getting crit with a Psychic, being fully paralyzed, before finally being able to finish the battle with an Ice Beam. This battle wasn't pretty, but we made it through. Agatha's status effects can be so annoying, especially in these solo runs. I guess it's probably some karma for the status conditions only run I did a little while back. It gave me a better appreciation for how strong status moves can be in Gen 1, and I'd recommend checking it out if you haven't done so yet. But you should wait until the end of this video first because we're back to face Lance again. Lance isn't really challenging though. Just like before, Gyarados is a two shot with Ice Beam, and then the only other place we take damage is from a fly with Aerodactyl. Lance really struggles against our ice typing and he just can't handle it. So once again, we're going to make our way back and face the champion. Last time we only used one rare candy to prep here and I think it would be possible, but last time showed us we needed a little bit more help to get through. So I decide to use both rare candies we have here. It gives us the best chance to get through and it should help with the damage rounding a little bit as well in case we need it. We're also going to be healing up our legendary bird and restoring all of the PP we have used so far. And with that, we should be ready to take on our rival again. Let's find out if we can get Articuno into the Hall of Fame. Cue the champions theme music and see how it goes. We'll start the same as before, mimicking Earthquake, but this time we're going to get a break as it goes for Poison Sting and we don't get poisoned instead of Slash. This lets us set up agility early in the battle. While we continue our setup, we got a miss from Fury Swipes and two slashes, so that is bringing us now to under half health before we move to the attack and take out the Sand Slash. However, we now outspeed the Alakazam, and a single Earthquake, thanks to the Badge Boost glitch, is enough to take it out. Executor is out next, and we know that Fly would take it out, but Ice Beam also does, and that means we're doing really well moving on to Cloyster. We start off with a critical hit Ice Beam to do about one third damage as a clamp misses and a non-crit takes about another third off of Cloyster's health. We end up taking 18 damage from a spike cannon and we can finish Cloyster off with an Ice Beam. But I misclick and hit an Earthquake which leaves it with a sliver of health. We get punished when we get hit with a clamp. That's gonna last for three turns and takes us to red health before we're able to finally take out the giant clan. Ninetales is going to be out next, and thanks to Earthquake, this is no problem, and that's an easy one-shot, bringing out his Ace Jolteon. Fortunately for us, our setup pays off, and we still haven't leveled up, so our badge boosts are in place, and a single Earthquake knocks out Jolteon, winning us the battle and the run. And what a run that was. Sure, we had a couple of small bumps, but that was one of the smoothest runs that I've had so far. The high base stats from being a legendary really showed as every level made this icy bird so much more powerful. Add in the strong typing in the early game and this bird made short work of the game. Now all that's left to do is figure out how Articuno stacked up against the other competitors we've seen so far. Knocking out Jolteon gave us just enough experience to level to 61 and that's where we're going to come in for this run. This level is higher than Tauros, but Articuno comes in with the first sub 4 hour time on the channel. It finishes with a time of 3 hours and 58 minutes, beating Tauros by 6 minutes. Articuno definitely earned its legendary status. Considering that I definitely did not play this optimally, I think it did very well overall. It did so well, I'm actually going to place it at the top of the tier list, ahead of Tauros. Although it's really close between the two for the top spot, I think the early game speed and a lot of the mid game that Articuno just dominated makes up for the broader coverage and strength of Tauros in the end game. If you have any thoughts, let me know in the comments below, and maybe we'll re-rank this list later. But remember, this is a tier list, so Pokemon in the same tier are pretty much even in the way that they're performing in the game. With Articuno now at the top of the tier list, let's see who the next to enter the ring will be. As we go to the wheel to see who is going to try to take down Articuno, we see our next run will be completed with Kadabra, a very interesting one. 
This will be interesting, and I don't know if it will be able to compete for a couple of different reasons, but we'll see when the next video comes out. That's all for this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to be notified when all the newest videos get released. As always, if you have any ideas on how to make these runs more entertaining, let me know in the comments below. It's been a crazy year with the beginning of this channel and a lot of personal things in my life, so I do want to thank everyone who subscribed and to those who are watching now. It means so much to me to be able to bring these to you all, and I hope that you have a great end to 2022 and to get off to a fantastic start in 2023. So for the last time this year, I'm Druzy, and I hope to see you all again soon.